Lest you think that higher education is only a back burner issue, and the only reason I talk about it so much is because I'm a professor, we should discuss and admit that higher education is a central part of the problems we're all facing and trying to deal with on this channel. I assume that it's we who are trying to deal with it and not just me because of the comments I see underneath the videos. We can't solve our problems merely by voting, we need to overthrow the system. And a central part of the system is the university. The university is not a passive observer. The university is a tool of the oligarchs. Shippensburg University is part of the PA state system of higher education. It's one of the 14 sister schools of which my school, Millersville University, is also a member. This piece by Doug Lyons is from the World Socialist website. Many, many good articles are to be found at wsws.org. If you want your thoughts to be provoked, go to this website. Shippensburg faculty member demands action to save jobs and university education for working class students. The Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education, we call it PASHI, with the backing of both the Democrats and Republicans and the assistance of the unions has embarked on a campaign to close state schools, lay off faculty members, and cut academic programs for students. Enrollment has declined over the past decade due to rising tuition and few opportunities for good paying and secure jobs for college graduates. This has caused many students to spurn the state system and find alternative ways to attain education and make ends meet without being burdened with mountains of tuition debt. The state system comprises 14 state schools, some of which will be closed in the coming years, and an enrollment of roughly 95,800 as of 2019. Since the pandemic hit in the early spring of 2020, enrollment has declined and PASHI has had to issue refunds for students and educators who refuse to attend the unsafe schools. The World Socialist website spoke with a faculty member at the Shippensburg University of Pennsylvania, about 41 miles from the state capital of Harrisburg, about the layoffs and cuts, which have been rapidly accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. These system changes being pushed through by the chancellor are the most destructive we have seen from any chancellor in my decade plus in the system. This is me speaking. I have decades plus, not just decade plus in the system, and I'll agree with him. The prior chancellors, John Kavanaugh and Frank Brogan, both pushed for online programs and a fundamental change to our system. He should get a load of Judy Hempel. And many faculty members believe they would push to consolidate universities. At least then, the union leaders pushed back against the chancellor. However, with this new chancellor, Dr. Dan Greenstein, perhaps because he comes off as a hip, new Democrat, Microsoft tech guy, the union leadership welcomed him with open arms, ignored direct warnings about the Gates Foundation's higher ed model that Greenstein developed over his prior six years, and even agreed to engage in interest-based bargaining with a guy they knew nothing about. This is me speaking. My nickname for him is Gilderoy, for those of you who can catch a Harry Potter reference. As a result of that, he has been able to push changes that are much worse than the prior two chancellors and, as I see it, changes that have the potential to destroy the system and further limit access to quality higher education for working PA families. I see him this way too. I see him as a stealthy Clinton slash Obama new Democrat who can get away with a lot worse stuff than Republicans can get away with. When Greenstein was sworn in by Democratic Governor Tom Wolf in January of 2019, he said, I'm talking about a fundamental transformation and redesign of the state system entailing closures and public private partnerships. Greenstein had previously worked for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation using identity politics and online technology to provide more equity in schools, divvying out more academic and administration posts to minorities and women, rather than equality and greater access for lower income students of all races. And as we've seen, if you've been watching this show, that's right out of the Biden playbook. The kind of diversity in his cabinet is not the kind of diversity that actually helps working class people. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for its part, is notorious for attacking public education at the K through 12 and higher education levels. It has supported charter schools, siphoning public education budgets to fund them, and has pushed for various reform measures such as billion dollar endeavor to increase teacher effectiveness and new curriculums. 
K-12 and higher education is not safe from the hands of such money-making capitalists. And for whatever reason, and we know the reasons, ka the neoliberal media are not going to make this point of view clear to anyone. Hell, they won't even talk about it. When have you ever seen anything negative about the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in the news? As Greenstein took over as chancellor of Pashi, being praised by Democratic Governor Tom Wolf, he offered the same educational paradigm for which Bill Gates, one of the richest people in the world, had hired him. The reduction of faculty, closure of schools, and competitiveness based on cuts, all of which the union, the Association of Pennsylvania State College and University Faculties, APSCUF, have embraced, mounting no opposition to defend rank-and-file educators. I have to say, as a former faculty member of Edinburgh University, which is another sister school that closed all of its degree programs in music, I'd say it's clear that the union doesn't give a shit about any of this and about any of us. They mounted no substantive opposition to my and other educators in the system being retrenched. Our union leaders are tools of the neoliberal establishment. In 2016, faculty members at PASHI launched a strike to defend their jobs in healthcare, as well as adjuncts and students from proposed cuts after working without a contract for over a year. It was the first strike in the system's history. The action was quickly shut down by the union leaders, I'm saying, without APSCUF allowing the rank and file to see what was in the tentative contract for fear that it would be rejected, leading to a broader movement against the Democratic Party and its austerity measures. I wish somebody would show this video to Gene Jones. That's J-E-A-N-J-O-N-E-S, in case anyone is trying to find her on Facebook. I remember saying in an APSCUF meeting, and I was a leader in APSCUF at Edinburgh University, I remember saying, I am so fucking tired of our union leaders not doing anything substantive to fix the problems we face. If we want smaller class sizes, we need to strike until we get smaller class sizes. It's not rocket science. And always the shit libs in the union would say, oh, I think that's going a little bit too far. They were always eminently reasonable. Back to the story. The union leadership, while talking a good game, has done little or nothing to really push back against these initiatives. They have proven over the years, such as the faculty strike in 2016, to be complicit, naive, and or feckless and weak. I'll go with feckless and weak. They accepted CBA collective bargaining agreement language changes in a TA, tentative agreement, that the former union president literally told us he did not know exactly what they meant. They have continually pushed back against any member action against retrenchments, the process by which university management can lay off tenured faculty by citing financial reasons. That's what happened to me, dear viewers and listeners, back in 2014. And now we have heard nothing about steps we can, should, or would be supported in taking concerning the chancellor's so-called system transformation. This is me again. Not only smaller class sizes, but we should have struck about retrenchment. We should have said that if you're firing tenured faculty members, we're going to go on strike until you put them back in their jobs. This is me still talking. Remember that when we talk about neoliberalism, we always talk about austerity as well. We simply can't afford that is how they control us. Back to our intrepid Shippensburg faculty member. The only way faculty, staff, and the working families who depend on the state system of education are going to be able to push back is through direct action, rank-and-file committees, and grassroots movements to push back. I always said we just need to strike until we get what we need. The Socialist Equality Party has spearheaded the formation of rank-and-file safety committees for educators in Pennsylvania, Texas, California, New York, California, Michigan, and other states to fight the homicidal return to unsafe schools, including the fight for a general strike to close schools, universities, and non-essential workplaces while guaranteeing full compensation to workers and small business owners. Fuck yes. That's what I've been talking about, too. According to the Shippensburg professor, the financial constraints and debt of PASHI is being grossly exaggerated by Greenstein and university management to push through immediate and deep restructuring. The premise of the cuts and the need for system transformation are simply not true. Even a cursory look at the financials of the system show that direct educational services are not the source of the increasing costs in the system. However, the accounting system is set up to lump administrative costs into direct educational costs, he said. 
One of the metrics used by Greenstein and his ilk is to predict student enrollment in PASHI based on high school graduation rates. The high school graduation projections from PDE, Pennsylvania Department of Education, also do not support the exigency that the chancellor suggests. While there were a couple of years of bubbles in terms of grads that are always used as the baselines, the reality is that high school graduation rates are fairly steady moving forward with one or two outlier down years. I didn't know that. I've always just believed the cockamamie bullshit they spew at us. On top of this, state cuts to PASHI and university officials mismanaging funds to entice students to attend a particular school contributed to the drop in enrollment. One of the things you will notice is that we have lost about four to five percentage points of students going on to higher education. It is not a coincidence that this drop coincided with state cuts that led to increases in tuition and the building of luxury dorms that increased the cost of attendance dramatically. The debt service on these residence halls and other buildings that were far overpriced has played a role in tightening the financial pressure on our campuses, forcing students back to campus during a pandemic and drastically increasing student debt loads. In fact, in some cases, campuses are now requiring students to spend two years in the dorms so the universities can cover the costs of these buildings. Dear viewers and listeners, I hope you're suitably outraged by this crap. It makes me feel embarrassed to be part of such a scam. Though students deserve the best and affordable living situation, university officials constructed penthouse suites to attract students to attend their school as opposed to another PASHI school. The result has been a disaster for students, outrageous prices for room and board, and a requirement that students must pay for these luxurious rooms in order to have an education. It's purely extortion. In addition, top university officials are still raking in high salaries as faculty have been let go and cheap adjuncts are used to fill the new vacancies at a much lower salary and without benefits. When you look across top administration in the system as new individuals have come in, their salaries have far exceeded their predecessors. This includes Dan Greenstein, but also the presidents on campuses and then their cabinet positions and top level admin across the board. Greenstein makes $380,000. A list of some of the university president's incomes are as follows. Kenneth Hawkinson, Kutztown, $284,633. Daniel Wuba, Millersville, $278,000. Lori Carter, Shippensburg, $278,000. Robert Pignatello, Lock Haven, $232,000. Gui Yu Huang, Edinburgh, $252,450. Bashar Hanna, Bloomsburg, $278,000. Christopher Fiorentino, Westchester, $310,459. Michael Driscoll, Indiana, $390,235. Charles Patterson, Mansfield, $242,540. When compared to associate professor's income, which is the middle rank out of three, which ranges, according to the public record, as low as 63,000 into the 90,000 range, university presidents are making four to six times more than the faculty who are the driving forces of schools. PASHI had been built upon its creation as an affordable alternative for working class and lower middle class students to attend college, attracting faculty members who wanted to make a mark on their students and the broader community. This is one of the reasons I and most faculty work here. We could have gone to private universities and made more, but we chose to stay here because of our belief in access for the working class and I would add middle class families to that today. The big point to me is that every working class and middle class family with a child who is not yet college age should be up in arms about this system transformation. The only way they'd be up in arms is if they heard about it. You have to go to WSWS.org to even read about this. The only way we can take action is by mobilizing ourselves. The union is not going to take action. They have already said so. We are going to have to get the word out and build community support. We will get that support once they see what is going on. The WSWS will provide a voice for all those willing to fight for free, high-quality education and against faculty cuts and the homicidal return to unsafe schools. All those interested should join the Pennsylvania Rank and File Safety Committee and the National Network of Rank and File Safety Committees. I want to end with the last half of this article, How the University Became Neoliberal by Andrew Seale. This was written back in June of 2018. 
The first half of the article is good too, but I wanted to cut to the chase. One of the central points of the first half of the article is that we've been running universities as though they were businesses. And the other point is that university administrators have been complicit. And you can also read into it that university professors have been complicit as well. We'd like to pretend that our hands are not dirty, but they are. The 2008 financial crisis caught many people by surprise, but not David Harvey, a British geographer at the City University of New York. Like Jameson, and he's referring to Frederick Jameson's notion of late capitalism, which makes it sound kind of apocalyptic. So like Jameson, Harvey's early work used the concept of postmodernity to analyze capitalism, but as a social scientist, his work was rooted in political economy rather than cultural critique. This difference led to an abrupt shift in nomenclature. In 2005's A Brief History of Neoliberalism, Oxford University Press, Harvey argued that the capitalism of the past quarter century operated not by overwhelming individuals and non-market values with its complexity, but simply by running roughshod over any resistance it found. Neoliberalism's only purpose, he argued, was to restore immense power to economic elites. Ding, ding, ding! Unlike mid-century liberal capitalism, it required only compliance, not assent, and ignored questions of long-term stability. Harvey pointed at the beginning of his book to the Iraq War as an example of neoliberalism in action. The course of the war with its brutal shock and awe tactics, brazen profiteering and incompetent planning seemed only to confirm his broader argument. These conditions made of Harvey and his emphasis on classical Marxist political economy an unlikely icon. In 2008, a YouTube series of his lectures on volume one of Marx's Capital became an unexpected viral phenomenon just as global markets were melting down. For a newly invigorated academic left, Harvey became the key interpreter of the financial crisis. In his 2011 The Enigma of Capital, Oxford University Press, he argued against popular explanations of the crisis as a chance event or as merely the result of poor decisions on the parts of some key financial actors. Rather, 2008 was the natural outcome of the ordinary operations of capitalism. There was no such thing as crisis-free capitalism, he argued. As long as we live with capitalism, we will live with periodic crises, some of them severe. Professor Richard Wolff has made similar arguments. Harvey's timing again was excellent. The enigma of capital came out just as the window of hope that 2008 would produce real and positive reforms slammed shut. Disbelief that such a major financial disaster had not caused a greater New Deal-like transformation of political priorities in Washington would lead to 2011's Occupy Wall Street movement. If Occupy was built on anger that Wall Street could slink back to normal operations so quickly, on campuses 2008 seemed to have introduced a shocking new normal. Although the twin crises of adjunctification and mounting student debt began well before 2008, academics were in staunch denial that these trends were baked into the modern university. They were outside impositions of corporate logic. They could be banished summarily and academe's real non-commercial purpose re-established. Wouldn't that be nice? Although analysts like Marc Bouquet were already arguing that this self-assurance was naive, you think? Many academics presumed that the obvious failures of market logic in 2008 would convince administrators of the folly of further dalliances with corporate values and practices. After riding out a few rough years, higher education could emerge from the crisis emboldened to return to its proper mission. The first shiver of disillusionment came, and I remember this well, when at most institutions, the job searches that seemed to be merely on hold until university budgets righted themselves never materialized. The shift toward contingent labor did not abate but increased, a fact that hit recent PhDs particularly hard. But production of new doctorates did not slow down, creating a glut of highly qualified candidates stuck in a stagnant job market. Which, dear viewers and listeners, is exactly how our corporate masters want it. A glut of highly qualified candidates and not enough jobs for them. What could be better? Younger students may have become disillusioned even earlier as the 2008 crisis appeared to embolden administrators not to back away from corporate values but to jack up tuition. Dean Terry L. Smith, are you listening to this? Dean Terry L. Smith, you are a 
fucking asshole and you put this in place as soon as you were able. This guy, when he was a professor, was a philosophy professor. That's what neoliberalism does to the hearts and souls of academics who become administrators. If Dean Terry L. Smith ever had a soul to begin with, it was rotted beyond all recognition. By the time he retired, he was no longer a human being. For a little context, he was the academic dean who instigated all of the big cuts and retrenchments back in 2014 at Edinburgh University. Back to the story. Younger students may have become disillusioned even earlier as the 2008 crisis appeared to embolden administrators not to back away from corporate values but to jack up tuition. Protests of tuition hikes in the University of California system roiled campuses beginning in 2009. Certainly by 2011, when the infamous pepper spraying incident at UC Davis occurred, any hope that higher education would be willing or able to turn away from its policies of austerity and high tuition had evaporated. With optimism extinguished, contingent academics and students loaded down with school debt began to see themselves not as unique failures of a functioning system, but as utterly typical of an economic order devouring itself from within. That self-understanding gelled with Harvey's insistence that capitalism was intrinsically crisis-prone. Crises were features rather than bugs of the capitalist operating system. With the shared bleakness of global recession and dwindling job prospects, scholars began mobilizing across national borders. The most important group, the Edu Factory Collective, had roots in Italy. Their slogan was, As once was the factory, so now is the university an idea that focused the collective's discussions not merely on higher education as a part of neoliberalism, but as its central institution. That's what I was trying to say at the beginning of this diatribe. Higher education is neoliberalism's central institution. No wonder it makes me feel dirty to be a part of it. Capitalist production had entered a new phase, many collective members argued, where the generation of knowledge and the production of knowledge workers had replaced the manufacturing of physical commodities as the driver of the economy. In this new cognitive capitalism, control of the university in material as well as ideological terms would become as crucial and contested as control of the factory floor had been to the earlier labor movement. In contrast to the earlier critics of the corporate university who mostly imagined a future in which higher education could simply reset to its non-corporate golden years, the collective refused to yearn for the public or mass university of the past. We vindicate the university's destruction. We are not merely immune to tears for the past, but enemies of such a nostalgic disposition. Wow, that's tough talk, little britches. The collective began as an email list discussion in 2007 and claimed to have had about 500 militant students and researchers participating. But its real impact came a few years later when its texts began circulating in multiple languages. The English version of its packet of readings toward a global autonomous university, cognitive labor, the production of knowledge, and exodus from the education factory came out in 2009, and in the period 2011 to 13, when its ideas blossomed through the global wave of occupations and student strikes and other actions against debt, tuition hikes, and austerity. Edu factory conferences in Australia and Canada occurred in 2012 and 2013. Like the Edu Factory Collective, current critiques of academic neoliberalism emphasize the centrality of higher education to the key narratives of exploitation, capitalist, racial, or both, of American history. Such work consistently links the conditions of the university to more general and fundamental conditions in the world. It's our fucking fault. These critics argue that the problems that plague higher education today, weak or non-existent job markets for new PhDs, racial tensions on campus, controversies about tuition hikes, sexual assault and harassment, are not simply rough patches in a cycle of good and bad times, nor are they campus issues to be analyzed and addressed as conditions unique to the ivory tower. That's brilliant. Yes, sexual assault and harassment are products of neoliberalism. Our administrators and department chairs and assistant department chairs who want to cover everything up are doing so in the name and spirit of neoliberalism. Meanwhile, perpetrators of sexual assault get a slap on the wrist or go scot-free. I base this on detailed information that I know personally and not secondhand. 
That one problem, sexual assault and harassment, is rampant on college campuses. Both the anti-war activism of the 1960s and the culture wars of the 1990s tested the idea that campus issues were distinct from broader political and social divisions, but popular memory has tended to frame these histories as politics erupting on campus, as if higher education were both distinct from the rest of society and politically quiescent. Activists and intellectuals who apply neoliberal to the university would like to see that premise shattered. Higher education, they contend, is not a neutral arena where neoliberal or corporate values struggle for control of the future with a set of non-commercial humanistic values. Neoliberal politics aren't coming from outside the ivory tower. The collar is in the house. The university will have to be reclaimed and rebuilt, not merely rebooted. The phrase neoliberal university, in other words, isn't Kant or a faddish bit of jargon. From Wikipedia, Kant, a Kant is the jargon or language of a group often employed to exclude or mislead people outside the group. It may also be called a cryptolect, argo, anti-language, or secret language. Each term differs slightly in meaning, their use is inconsistent. So the phrase neoliberal university isn't Kant or a faddish bit of jargon. It is the name for a new understanding of higher education's integral role in the present economic order. It is also a sort of wager, or if you like, a prophecy. The university will be central to present and future struggles to change the world.